Welcome back. As you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy and in today's class we are going to be doing an overview of all the basic networking equipment that you'll deal with in an Ethernet network. So we're going to be talking about routers, we're going to be talking about switches, we're going to talk about modems, we're going to talk about a little bit about power over Ethernet, power line networking, and a whole bunch of different equipment that you might see in an Ethernet type network. Uh, so for this particular class we're going to be doing the eagle eye view. Basically this is going to be a one mile up view looking down with this equipment and then in classes that we'll be doing in the future uh, we'll get more into the nitty gritty about each particular type of equipment the routers the switches power line uh, ethernet the whole nine yards so basically in today's class we're going to diagram out a network i'm going to show you where all of these pieces of equipment are used so that you can have a good idea of what an ethernet network looks like when you go into your environment so the first thing that we need to talk about before we really get in this, this class is the difference between the concept of logical and physical, right? So whenever you start dealing with uh, Ethernet networking, you're going to hear about things being logical and things being physical. Uh, and especially for new people, this can get really complicated really quickly, right? So if we're sitting there, we're thinking about doing a basic uh, network diagram, right? We have the internet cloud here. We have the ISP connection that comes into your premises. And then when we're going to be diagramming this out a lot, Logically, the first thing that we're going to have is the modem, right? So you have the modem. The modem is what connects your Ethernet network to your cable internet service, your fiber optic internet service, your 5G internet service, whatever it is. Basically, you're going to have some kind of ISP. They are going to use uh, some type of tech, uh, networking technology in order to connect you to the internet. And basically, the modem is what connects your internal network to whatever that technology is. Again, whether it's wireless or fiber optic or cable or DSL or whatever else. So the first thing you have is your modem. Then inside the, the modem, when you're diagramming this out, the next thing that you're going to have is the router, right? So the router is what separates uh, IP networks, right? So you have your internal IP address scheme, one, uh, 192.168.1.x, right? That's your internal uh, network number that you're gonna be using. Uh, and basically what the router does is it allows you to route your computers uh, from the inside out to the internet. So you're going to have the router. Then in order to connect all of your computers uh, to the router, then you're going to have a switch, right? So the switch will be however many ports are on the switch, and then you can physically connect however many devices you want to uh, with the switch. On top of that, you're then uh, going to think about having a wireless access point. So if you want to be able to have Wi-Fi uh, for the users on your network, you're going to have to have uh, you know some kind of wireless access point that's going to be connected to the switch. And so you have the wireless access point there. On top of that, you may have some server services, as we talked about before, DHCP. Uh, that's what, the, what dynamically assigns IP addresses uh, to, to the clients that connect to the network. You may have a server that you want to have for DNS, a domain name uh, system. Uh, so this resolves uh, domain names to IP addresses. You may also even want to have some kind of storage uh, on your network, some kind of like file server, what we call a NAS, a network attached storage device, right? And so so basically when we're diagramming this out, this, this is what the network will logically look like. Now when we start talking about physically though, like when we actually think about what that network will physically look like, um, It'll, it'll look like this. It'll look like this, right? Uh, this is a 10-year-old Apple uh, Airport Extreme that this physically contains all the logical devices that we have here, right? Uh, so for this, actually, it doesn't have a modem in it. To be clear, it doesn't have a modem. You connect the modem, but you connect a modem to this, and then this is your router. This is your switch. This has your wireless access point built in to it. It has DNS built into it. It has DHCP built into it. It actually has file sharing services built into it and a whole bunch of other things, right? So I may sit down and 
I may diagram out what I want my network to look like and when I sketch it out on a piece of paper it'll look like the mess that I have uh, in front of you on the page but then when I, I go to actually install uh, you know this network it may actually be one single device and so this is one of those things that you're going to have to be thinking about whenever you're designing your network infrastructure now you may be used to uh, basically small office home office type networking equipment uh, that doesn't have a lot of networking ports uh, that doesn't have a lot of uh, different options on it but one of the important things to understand is once you get to the enterprise world and especially like the larger office world uh, that there's equipment that's designed for those larger offices that might provide you a lot more resources uh, so back in the day when I had my computer repair shop and we dealt with small business clients uh, there was a router uh, that we would sell our small business clients that would that had a 16 port switch on it right uh, so most of my small business clients were, were 10 users or under so I put in a router I that router has a 16 port switch on it and 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 a way to go it actually worked out very well uh, other things to be thinking about I actually have a QNAP device which has a switch and router and all kinds of stuff built in but it actually has a full-fledged server not only is it a full-fledged server but it's a server that allows you to do virtualization you can uh, create virtual instances of server uh, 2019 or Ubuntu or something else and actually have those virtual instances running uh, right on your networking equipment so one of the things to be thinking about when you whenever you go out to procure equipment for your environment uh, or whenever you're going to be designing your infrastructure physically is you sit down and you look at all the logical things like logically how you want your network to be built out and then you go to CDW you go to, to go to uh, Newegg Amazon or whatever else directly to Cisco and then one of the things that you might find out is that you can actually buy some piece of hardware that has all of the equipment that you need built into that one physical box and that can be very useful for you especially when you're going out and you're dealing with like remote sites again when I was in the enterprise world uh, we had lots and lots and lots of remote offices and so some of the remote offices were big up to 100 people and some of the remote offices had two people in them right uh, and so one of the issues we had is when you have an office with two people in them you don't have a full-fledged server room where you can put a server rack and patch panels and all that kind of crap a lot of times you literally have a closet <laughs> <laughs> you literally have an actual closet where you put a big sign in the closet that tells people do not shut the door so the equipment doesn't overheat. This happens in the real world, right? And so when you're dealing with an environment where you literally have a coat closet as your server room, um, basically finding a, a piece of equipment that has everything, even including the servers, all built into it, and that might be the most appropriate for your particular environment. So this is just something to be thinking about, again, whenever you go out to build out your, your environment, is the environment that you're going to build will look different uh, if it's in a thousand person or a 10,000 person's office building versus you know one of your remote sites for the lawyers or something like that where there may only be two or three people in the office and it's important to go out and take a look at all kinds of different companies again the cisco's of the world the junipers of the world sonic walls of the world but also companies such as qnap qnap makes some uh, some interesting network server type equipment where everything is built in so logically logically basically you have all of these different essentially services that you're going to provide on your network resources for your network and then the physical device is what what that you know what contains physically contains all of those services so the first piece of networking equipment that we need to talk about is your networking cable basically your patch cable and all of your cat 5 hopefully cat 6 hopefully not cat 3 cable that you have running throughout your building i will put a bet of five dollars on the table right now that if you've dealt with very many uh, office environments and there's a slowdown in the network that most likely one of your bottlenecks is actually the network cable that was installed 20 years ago and a lot of people don't even want to think about dealing with the cable itself. So there is actually specifications for this cable. When you look at networking cable, uh, it all looks the same. So the old uh, Cat3 cable that we use, honestly, when you just look at it, when you have cable in your hand, it looks a hell of a lot like Cat6 cable. The problem is, is that the specifications uh, that were written for cable has changed over the years. And so the specifications for Cat3 
3 cable is a hell of a lot different than the specifications for Cat 6 cable. So whenever you're dealing with a cable, right, basically you're going to have a connector. So you're either, either going to have the connector on the cable itself, or you're going to have a jack. The jack will be on your wall, and this is what is called an RJ45 cable. Inside, uh, inside this cable, uh, there's four pairs. Uh, so you have four pairs. So there's actually eight uh, strands of wire in here. Um, and basically that is what is called twisted pair cable. Uh, if you take a look at it, if you actually open one of these things up and take a look at it, uh, each, each pair set is twisted. And there's something about that twisting that allows uh, or protects uh, your networking cable from interference coming in from the outside world. Uh, so one of the things you have to be thinking about with this network cable is this network cable is basically a really long wire, uh, which looks a lot like an antenna, right? You know, think about an antenna, right? Especially if you're if you're in the old days and you had old bunny ear uh, antenna or things like that. Uh, one of the big things when you have a, a long wire that's running through walls or whatever is it can pick up external radio signals uh, from the outside world, uh, and especially with the old networking equipment that could cause a lot of problems. Um, even fluorescent lights, uh, it was so bad back in the day uh, that fluorescent lights, if your network cable went anywhere near a fluorescent light, fluorescent lights actually uh, give off an RF signal. That RF signal could literally get into your network cable and then... <laughs> troubleshooting of fun, fun would ensue. So anyways, uh, basically they, they twist the, the cable in here and I don't know, something about electronic theory that that, that, that protects uh, from the outside interference. But then when you get to the actual, uh, the full-fledged cable itself, uh, there's a Cat3 cable, it's called Cat3 cable, Cat5 cable, Cat5e cable, uh, and a Cat6 cable. And these are standards for networking cable uh, that were created Created at specific times. So CAT3 cable, uh, as I said, it looks a lot like CAT6 cable, but basically the standards for CAT3 cable way back when were for 10 megabit per second connections. Uh, so you go back to I don't know, the 1990s, 1995, you were you were wiring up a building for all of your, your Windows 95 or Windows NT machines, and you were really happy because you just have computers talk to each other. And so your building may have been wired using Cat3 uh, that was created for a standard to only be able to transmit data at about 10 megabits per second. Again, understand with these standards, it's a minimum, so a lot of the cable can actually do a lot better, but the minimum is 10 megabits megabits per second for cat3 when you go up to cat5 so cat5 was designed for the 100 megabit per second world and to be clear in my career i have actually installed a hell of a lot of cat5 cable and so all of that network wiring that i put in was essentially designed for a 100 megabit per second world we then have cat e, uh, cat5 uh, sorry cat5e cat5e was was the next iteration of cat5 that was designed for gigabit networking and then CAT6, which should be getting installed now, is designed for 10 gigabit networking. And so an important thing to be thinking about with your particular environment is that Networking cable, basically, you know, it'll be around in, in to, you know, with a cockroaches. Once we have all destroyed ourselves in a nuclear war, uh, the, the cockroaches are going to be using your network cable to do, uh, do um, whatever, jump rope with or something like that. This networking cable doesn't fail unless a rat eats it. I have seen that. Unless a rat or a mouse eats your networking cable or something like that happens, a networking cable just keeps doing what networking cable does, right? There could be a big problem with this in the corporate world because here's the thing, right? CEOs do not like to pay a lot of money <laughs> to essentially replace what they consider something that already works fine in order to get something that will provide the exact same services that they already have, right? When a CEO is sitting there and they're trying to think about budgets and where to spend money, right? They have to think about uh, basically, you know, how much money to give the IT department. They have to think about how much money to give the marketing department. They have to think about what kind of toilet paper, you know, they're gonna be able to afford for the company, right? When a CEO sits down, there's a lot of things the CEO has to think about as far as, as, as budgeting things go. And one of the things they do not want to spend any money on is replacing something that they think already does a darn fine job. And so when you look at networking cabling, uh, networking cabling many times costs about $150 per run. 
which is a lot of money. <laughs> I remember those days. I remember those days. Anyways, so from, from a port on your office wall, basically to the patch panel in your server room, each one of those ports will cost the company about $150 to run. If you have four ports, that are that are on the exact same panel on the wall that is a six hundred dollar run and by golly we do bill that much it's a beautiful thing so right you go around you look around your office and you look at all those ports on the wall you start adding up you know multiply by 150 and for a reasonable size office, this can genuinely be tens of thousands of dollars of, of, of cost in order to replace the cabling that already exists. And so one of the problems that you may have is, is if you're in an office environment that was wired up in the 90s or the early 2000s, one of the reasons that your uh, network may not be going at the speed you're expecting it to go is because of the crappy ass wire uh, that's actually inside your walls. And so that is something for you to be thinking about when you're going and troubleshooting and trying to figure out why all this fancy, this, this new fancy hardware, the computer hardware that you have uh, is relatively slow. The other thing to be thinking about is the same thing can be said about patch, patch uh, cables, right? So this is a patch cable right here. Basically you use patch cables to either connect your computer to the wall or connect the, uh, the, the, um, the patch panel to the switch within with inside your server room and and again patch pa patch cables literally last forever so what are the chances you have some cat 3 patch cable that's just you know been in your your networking closet for years and years and years and years you can't figure out why your slur server is dog slow, right? You go, you look at task manager, you do all the, the, these performance evaluations and your server is still dog slow on the network. One of the things to, to realize is that maybe it's quite literally the patch cable that you're using. Uh, so patch cables can be very significant in your environment. And this is one of those places where you can run into problems simply because you're using stuff that still works, uh, but it's pretty old. Uh, beyond that, as far as networking cable is concerned, uh, there is a type of cable called crossover cable. So generally, almost always, uh, whenever you connect a, a computer to another computer, you're going to have a switch in between, right? So basically you plug, you plug one side of this into a computer, you plug the other side of this into a switch, uh, the, then you do the same thing for the other computer that you want the first computer to communicate with, and then they're able to communicate. Um, if for some reason you want to be able to d literally directly connect computers, so you want computer A to be directly connected to computer B, no switch, no other networking equipment in between, you cannot use a normal straight through patch cable. If you try, it shouldn't work. Shouldn't, I will say shouldn't. You will need something called a crossover cable. So what the crossover cable does is it essentially uh, in the in the uh, the wiring when you crimp it, uh, you're switching the, the 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 transmission and the receive uh, wires in here. So basically, when one side sends, it will then cross over in the cable to go to the receive side on the other computer, and the other computer where it sends it will cross over to the receive side on the first computer. And so you have to have something called a crossover cable uh, in order to have two computers uh, just be able to communicate directly with each other. So with this, you would not have DHCP because you don't have any other server or services on the network. So we go in and you would manually configure, manually configure the IP address and at least the subnet mask. That's basically all you need. Uh, and then with that, you would use a crossover cable to connect the two computers. And then you would have fun trying to get them to communicate with each other. So if you do try to do that, you would use something called a crossover cable. Um, again, I, I don't know, in decades, I can actually say that in decades of being in the technology world, I have probably used a crossover cable, you know, a, a few times, probably less than five times for anything that's serious. Uh, but so you should know that crossover cable ex exists, but generally you don't use them because it's a pain in the butt. Again, it's two computers directly connected to each other. You don't get any network services. You can't get to the internet because it's only those two computers talking to each other. So generally it's not actually a very useful way to connect computers. So anyways, the first, the first piece of networking equipment in the, uh, in the ethernet networking world 
is going to be your cable uh, and it's important to understand you know what cable you actually have in your walls and what you're using for your patch cables because this can actually cause you some real problems in the real world so the next piece of networking equipment that we need to talk about is called a NIC, a network interface card, right? So whenever you, you see a desktop computer or a laptop computer and it has a jack in it, an RJ45 jack, that is going to be your network interface card or your network card. Uh, generally, there's not a lot to be thinking about whenever you're dealing with a network interface card. One of the things to be thinking about in the modern world is again, when we talk about speeds, you can have 10, a 10 100, 10 1000 basically a gigabit per second card uh, or all the way up to a 10 uh, gigabit per second uh, networking card actually built into your computer uh, this can be very important for you depending on how old uh, the servers are in your infrastructure so servers generally don't last as long as most networking equipment uh, right switches and routers can last for 20 or 30 years um, you know, again, the, the patch cables or whatever can, can last, you know, as long as the cockroaches do. Most of the time, servers go away after a while, right? You know, after, oh, after five or 10 years, they generally go away. And so since we're in the 2020s right now, basically any computer that's in your infrastructure should, should have a gigabit per second network card built into it. But... But, but again, this is the real world. And sometimes if a piece of equipment is doing what the equipment is supposed to do, uh, CEOs don't want to replace it. And so you might have a really, 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 really old computer on your network uh, that may simply have a 10, 100 megabit per second uh, network card in it, or possibly even a 10 megabit per second card in it, uh, though hopefully not at this point in time. Why this is important is if you have uh, your, your, your server or your computer connected to the network, it will only be able to, to send data back and forth as fast as whatever the, the fastest speed it has. Uh, and so if you have one of these old uh, network cards uh, actually connected to the server on your network, that's one of the places where you may be having a bottleneck, you may be having slow, a slowdown. One of the good things though, is that if you're dealing with a server or a desktop computer, is that basically this is a card that you can simply install into your computer and and so you can actually install a better network card into your desktop or into your server in order to provide better speed, right? So if you have an old network card in an old computer, you might be able to plug a gigabit per second networking card into that particular server in order to try to boost the speed. Again, something like a file server, right? You might be in an environment uh, where you have some crappy old file server. It does what it needs to do. It doesn't need to do a lot, just, just share files. And so it may be that for the users on the network that it's really, really, really slow uploading and downloading files and simply swapping out the network card will give them a lot better performance. Especially nowadays when you think a network card you know, it's probably going to cost you fifteen or twenty dollars if you're a salary IT uh, employee at your corporation. Simply getting a new network card and slapping it into a server or two that may be a very cost-effective way to simply boost the performance of of your network a little bit uh, or the the services that are provided on your network. Just one of those things to think about. Something else to be thinking about is when you deal with networking cards uh, in servers, is you can actually have multiple networking cards in servers, and they can have actual Actually different IP addresses uh, so there may be a reason you want let's say uh, web services and uh, WA HTTP services you want them going into one network card you may have a different network card where you want the FTP services going through that network card you may have a different network card on that where you want some other I don't know SSH remote remote administration services going through that network card so one of the things to realize is you can actually have multiple network cards in one server and each of those network cards can have its own IP address. So the first one can be 192.168.1.11. Second one can be 192.168.1.12 and then .13 and .14 and so on. This is just one of those things uh, to keep in mind uh, as, as something that might be useful for you. Uh, when you look at actual network cards, one of the interesting things for servers nowadays is you can buy individual cards that you can 
can install into your server and they will actually have multiple NICs built into them. So it's one network card uh, and then you actually have multiple network interfaces built into that one network card. And again, with that, then you can have multiple different IP addresses for these different NICs uh, in order to do any kind of cool, interesting things that you may want to do. Uh, there are some interesting things that you can do with network interface cards, especially with uh, servers. You can do something uh, in the Windows world. It's called a NIC teaming which is kind of interesting. So if you have a, a network card like this one here, where it actually has four network interface ports, what you can do in Windows is you can make them all actually look as if they're one single network interface. And let's say an IP address 192.168.1. Let's say 11, right? So basically you can make these all look as if they are one single IP address. The value for that is that can then give you failover. If one port fails, or if you have multiple cards in your server and this, the, 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 uh, the entire card fails, then everything basically just fails over to the other network interfaces that you have installed onto that particular server. On top of that, uh, in order to do um, like load balancing or increase the speed of uh, uploads or downloads from the server, it can actually separate the uh, separate out the load uh, amongst the different uh, network cards or the network interfaces on that particular server so that the overall performance can imp improve uh, quite significantly. So these are some of the interesting things to be thinking about whenever you're dealing with these network interface cards. Uh, you know, it's a pretty simple thing. Basically, it's, you know, where you where you, you plug the network cable into for your computer or for your server. But it is something to be thinking about is if you go and you want to do some or research and figure out some of the cool tricks uh, that you can do with network interface cards. There are some interesting things out there. Okay, so now that you understand a little bit about patch cables and network interface cards, let's start talking about the networking equipment that you're probably thinking about, right? When you first started this class, you're thinking about networking equipment that I haven't really talked a lot about yet. Let's get into that. The first thing that I want to talk about today is the modem, right? So what the modem is going to do is the modem is going to take your TCP IP Ethernet network and it's going to basically translate the communication going on in that network into a form that the ISP, your internet service provider, can use, right? Uh, so think about this, right? So you have the cloud, right? This is the internet cloud uh, where Google and Amazon and all those are. Uh, basically, you're going to have your ISP and your ISP has a facility that directly taps into the internet fiber optic cable. So generally when you're dealing with the internet, the cloud, right? There are these main fiber optic lines and generally the ISPs tie directly into these main fiber optic lines. Again, I will say this, I'll say it generally generally but that's how it works there are there are fiber optic lines that that run all over the place and the isp they have a facility that connects into those fiber optic lines once the isp is connected to the fiber optic lines then there is the question though of how the isp is going to connect your building uh, to the internet in the modern world there are many different types of technology and there's different uh, media out there that isps can use right uh, so you can use coax cable so if you've heard of a cable internet service, basically they use the same cable they use in order to provide you cable TV and you're able to send and receive a, a internet service basically using that cable connection. You can have fiber optic lines. So here in the United States, Verizon was really big on something called Fios, uh, which was a fiber optic uh, lines to the premises. So essentially these are, this is glass cable, glass cable that runs from the ISP uh, to your premises. Nowadays in the modern world, you can have uh, modems from like uh, T-Mobile or Verizon Wireless. Uh, they, can, uh, they can be 5G. So essentially uh, you can use a a, a wireless connection to connect your building to the ISP. There's also what is called line of sight um, uh, radio. Uh basically. And with that, what it is, line of sight, uh, uh, essentially Wi-Fi, where the ISP has antenna, 
that, that can send and receive, you have a little antenna on your building that's pointed directly at their wireless networking equipment. And that's a way that you're able to connect uh, your, your local network to the ISP's equipment. So then your, the, uh, your data can get routed over the internet. So the device that basically translates your TCP IP, generally version four, ethernet, uh, networking communication, in order into something that the ISP understands, that is going to be your modem. Now, generally, again, generally in the modern world, again, especially if you're dealing with a, a small office or a home office, uh, the modem is going to be built into um, the network, the, the just one piece of networking equipment. So you'll have a modem, uh, that modem will have a router, it'll have a switch, It'll have your firewalls, it'll have your DNS, it'll have your wireless access points, the whole nine yards. It is important to understand though, in some areas, especially when you deal with something like DSL, so the old DSL modems were quite literally just a DSL modem. You'd have a modem inside your premises, and then you would have to connect to a router or to your networking equipment in, in order to make the, the DSL modem to be useful for you in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so you can have a DSL modem that is only a modem. Uh, if you're using T1 connections, so T1 or the family of, of T connections. So a T1 is a 1.54444 megabit per second connection, uh, which sounds really crappy unless it's the only connection that you can get. Uh, if you use a T1, uh, they use something called a CSU DSU. Uh, the brand name is usually Adtran. How many of you folks remember the word Adtran out there? Uh, but basically, if you have an Adtran, essentially it's the modem that's inside your building. Uh, it turns the, the T1 uh, communication into something that, that the rest of your network is able to understand. And so basically, you are going to have a modem inside your premises and that is going to connect to the ISP. Now it's important to understand how these modems connect to the ISP may be very, very, very different, right? So if you're using a cable modem, uh, back in the day when I was installing uh, cable modems and actually dealing with a cable company, uh, one of the interesting things is that the cable company used MAC address filtering uh, in order to allow cable modems to communicate with their network. So we were dealing with Comcast up in the Baltimore area and how they dealt with security is that basically only uh, only cable modems uh, with specific MAC addresses were allowed to communicate on the network. And so what you would have to do is if you installed a new cable modem, you would have to call up Comcast. You would generally have to ask them for what the hell the MAC address was supposed to be for the cable modem. And then you could go in and you could actually modify the MAC address on the cable modem. As soon as you did that, that then it was able to then connect to the network. Uh, if you were using a, D a DSL modem back in the day. Uh, many times you had to plug in the information for a telephone number. Uh, with DSL, uh, you generally had like a username and password. And so the DSL would basically just connect to the, the, to the DSL signal that was on your line. It would plug in the username, plug in the password. If that was correct, then the DSL would work, uh, work as you need it to work. Uh, if you're dealing with 5G in the modern world, uh, you have to generally have a, uh, what's it called, SIM card. Uh, so the SIM card uh, is something basically just like what you put into your smartphone. Uh, so if you have a 5G modem, you'll have a SIM card that will go into your 5G modem. Uh, and then you have to make sure that that actually registers with the... Uh, Oh, with the ISP, how it's supposed to, and then you can you can go about and, and actually then connect to the network. Um, I was dealing with AT and T. Uh, let me just say, don't deal with AT and T. <laughs> my my personal opinion, my personal opinion. I hate AT and T passionately. Anyways, I got a 4G modem for from AT and T, and it was just a disaster. <laughs> It was just a disaster. I had to do a lot of troubleshooting simply to get my 4G modem to connect with AT&T's infrastructure because AT&T couldn't be bothered to do a darn bit of customer service. Um, so these are some of the things that you need to be thinking about whenever you go in and you're dealing with a modem uh, in a particular environment is that there are going to be different ways that the network and that the modem will be able to communicate with the ISP's equipment. So you just have to make sure you understand how that works. 
works. And then if you're having a problem with the modem itself, you can go in and make sure the connections uh, or the, 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 uh, the settings and all that are how they should be. So all the modem does is it connects your internal network to your ISP's infrastructure. So the ISP can then connect you to those, those main fiber optic lines. Okay, so once we deal with the modem, right? So we have the cloud, the cloud comes in, it connects to the modem. Now the next piece of logical equipment, possibly physical equipment that you need to deal with is the router, right? So the router is very important for your network because the router is what connects your LAN to either the WAN or basically to the internet, right? So what happens is on your internal network, all of your devices are connected to the switch. All of your devices have a default gateway that's configured, that, that is the router. And so when a computer is trying to find another computer, if it's not able to find it on the local area network, it will then go to the default gateway and the default gateway will route the traffic out to the wider world uh, to see if you're able to access the server that way, right? So if you're trying again to go to CNN.com, obviously CNN.com isn't on your local network, so you'll go to your default gateway the router the router will then uh, send uh, send your uh, your packets through to the modem that will then go to the internet and then you'll find cnn.com in the outside world and then the traffic will be sent uh, back through the modem back through the router into the switch and then to your computer so you can actually view what is going on uh, with cnn.com uh, basically a router's Eh, routers are either really really simple or really complicated for most of you most of you routers are going to be very simple and you're not really going to have to think about it a lot again small office environments even mid-sized business environment a router is one of those things that's just kind of set up and you never think about it again right you have your modem you have your router that's connected to your switch and then you forget about it, right? So, so basically you have the, uh, the internal IP address for your router, 192.168.1.1. You have the external IP address for your router, which is, you know, I don't know, 205.66.44.2 uh, or something like that. And basically all the router is going to do is it's going to route the internal traffic outside and the, the outside traffic inside and you're not really going to have to mess with it very much. But it is important to understand that routers can be much, much, much more complicated. And when you start to design a more complicated infrastructure, you can do interesting things with routers. Like one of the things that you can do is when you get your service from your ISP, one of the things that you may have noticed is that you can get multiple uh, IP addresses from your ISP. Uh, so with like business class cable internet service, you may be able to get 10 uh, IP uh, v4 addresses from your ISP provider depending on what ISP you use you may be able to get a simple block of five four five ten IP addresses or you may pay like five dollars per month per IP address and why this is very interesting is that means you can create multiple networks inside your infrastructure depending on what it is that you want to do so let's say you want to run an e-commerce company and your e-commerce company is going to have multiple websites and essentially uh, it's uh, multiple types of its own infrastructure right uh, so let's say you want to create an e-commerce company for cars an e-commerce company for houses and I don't know because it's popular right now a dating e-commerce company right so you think about it it's like you're a coder you understand servers you understand infrastructure so all these you know dating dating and selling cars you know same same but different so you're like you know what i'm going to do i'm just, I'm just gonna basically replicate the infrastructure i want to I want it to be separated from each other uh, but i'm going to run these different uh, essentially these different uh, companies these different e-commerce companies from my own internal infrastructure so what your isp does is it can give you uh, three uh, external ip addresses so let's say 205.66.44.3 three dot four and dot five what's interesting here right so you have your connection to your isp whatever it's a cable or whether it's 5g whatever else you then have your modem right so the modem that's what connects you to the isp one of the interesting things you can do here is you can actually have your cat five or your cat i'm sorry your cat six cables what you should do and actually right at this point you can have a switch 
On that switch, you could then actually connect three different routers. The external IP address for this particular router will be 202.66.44.3, with the external for this router will be .4, and the external for this router will be .5. Inside this, you'll then have your own infrastructure, right? So this will be www.cars.com. This will be www.houses.com. And this will be uh, www.dating.com. Now, it's important to understand when you're actually uh, building out real uh, systems architecture, right? You may have clusters of servers, right? So, so for your web server, right, you may have what's called a reverse proxy. So you may have a reverse proxy where you actually have multiple web servers that are all connected to that, that reverse proxy. Users are sent to one particular uh, web server, basically depending on load. Uh, you may have a, a cluster for your databases. So if you're using uh, some kind of database system in order to, uh, to contain all the information for the dating profiles or the houses or whatever, you may have a cluster. So the cluster has has numerous different database servers. They replicate their data depending on whatever it is that they want to do, right? So basically, whenever you're, you're looking at this web infrastructure, this might be very, very, very complicated web infrastructure. But what's curious here is you can then go out to the internet, right? DNS and the internet, and you can say www, or actually what you do is say, you'd say cars.com. Basically, that points to 202.66.44.3. You would say then houses, dot com would then point to 206.44.202.66.44.4 and then you would say dating.com right this is in dns would point to uh, 202.66.44 44.5, uh, right? So when somebody is out on the internet and they're trying to get to dating.com, they will go into the cloud from where they're at they can then go through, uh, basically they will then get routed because of your ISP and because of your DNS uh, configurations. They will then come to the modem. The modem will then send the traffic to the switch that you have. And then your router that is connected, that is, uh, that's configured with 202.66.44.5, which is the, uh, Oh, which is the IP address for dating.com, that is where the traffic will get redirected and then all the traffic will go into your dating.com infrastructure and it is completely segregated uh, from the rest of the, uh, the infrastructure that you have. So if somebody is able to hack dating.com, they will not very easily be able to get into houses.com or into cars.com. And so that's one of the interesting things that you can do uh, with routers. Um, that is, again, beyond the simple thing. Uh, if you have a large infrastructure, uh, let's say... Uh Let's say this is a road. Let's say you have multiple buildings, right? So you have multiple buildings. You have a what's called a WAN, a wide area network. And so with these multiple buildings, you may have uh, different physical connections connected to all of these different buildings. One of the things you can do is you can have routers in each one of these buildings. And so basically, if one of these connections fails for some reason, the routers will be able to automatically route the, the, the traffic through uh, whatever uh, whatever path will be able to get the traffic uh, to where it's it's trying to go as easy as possible, right? So if this is the HR department, this is the, the legal department, uh, this is research down here, right if research is trying to get to the legal department but their main hardwired connection somebody put a backhoe through so now again this is not an internet connection this is simply essentially a wire that connects one building to another if you have routers configured routers route traffic between the different local area networks so we can see that the uh, the connection the direct connection to legal has has gone down for some reason and so it could route to one building that could route to another building and and then it could route to, to the legal department that way. And so that's one of the interesting things that you can do with routers. Um, basically, again, that's that's beyond kind of the standard thing that you normally think about. You think about it, most people, you have a router in your infrastructure, it's one router, it, it, it's, it's what, uh, what allows you to connect to the internet, and that's all you think about. But there's a lot of other interesting things that you can do with routers, and we are definitely going to be talking about that in a future class. Okay, so then once we get past the router, right? So we have the internet connection, we have your modem, we have your router, and then you have your hub, right? You have your hub. <laughs>
No, you do not have your hub. <laughs> You did not have a hub. That was a trick question. That was a trick question. And do you know what that trick question gives you the answer to? Whether or not you should drop out of your college right now and sue the ever-loving hell out of them. But anyways, that's my own pet peeve. So basically, what hubs were back in the day, we've talked about hubs before, was they were dumb splitters, right? So on Ethernet standard, the original way we connected all these different computers were through a hub. And essentially, in the modern world, think about this as a cable TV splitter where uh, the signal goes in and then it gets replicated out on every single port. Uh, yeah, no, this is horrible. Like back in the day, uh, essentially what this would do is this would create something called broadcast storms. So we do remember with the Ethernet standard, this is collision uh, avoidance, collision detection. So each device on the network, before it communicates, it will listen to see if anybody else is communicating. If it doesn't hear anybody communicating, it will then send out, send out traffic. If two, two computers send out traffic at the same time, there will be a collision. They can then recognize that the collision has occurred. They will wait a random amount of time uh, before they communicate again, and then they will try to communicate at that random amount of time. If you have four or five computers connected to a hub, it's not good, but I guess it'll sort kind of sort of work. If you have 100 computers connected to a hub, <laughs> you're just gonna have broadcast storms all the time, right? Uh, and so that's where they came up with something called a network bridge. So a network bridge essentially filters based off of MAC addresses. If the bridge knows a MAC address is on the other side, it will send the traffic through. If it knows it's not on the other side, it won't send the traffic through. Uh, and again, that was another piece of old network equipment that was great. Man, circa 1995, hubs and networking bridges were amazeballs. Uh, at this point in time, though, we use something called a switch. A switch essentially has a networking bridge on every single port of the switch. So essentially, a switch is like a hub, only if every port was a networking bridge. And so this is what we use in the modern world. If your college gives you a, gives you a diagram and asks you where to put the hub, the only correct answer is the trash can. The trash can is the right answer. Now, some people, some people try to try to play stump the chump with Eli, the computer guy, and they'll say, "No, but but no, hubs can still be useful." And I still say no. So what they say is why hubs can be useful is theoretically, if you're trying to troubleshoot problems on your network, since a hub sends out the exact same information on all its ports, the idea is if you have a server and your server is having some issues, one of the things that you might do is put a hub between your server and the switch, and then you put a different computer plugged into the hub and that different computer will read all of the traffic that is going to your server and all the traffic coming from your server and it'll basically do like what's called packet analysis or something like that in order for you to do troubleshooting, right? That's what the smarty pants say. That's what they're like, that, that's what I learned in my net plus, Eli. Yeah, don't, don't, don't do this. Don't do this. Why? Why should you not do this? Why is this damn near a stupid idea in the 2020s? The reason that this is a stupid idea in the 2020s is hubs, unless I'm completely incorrect, more or less have not been built for a long time. So the fastest hubs, the fast hubs back in the day were 10, 100 hubs, right? 10, 100 hubs. So imagine this, you have one gigabit per second uh, network card on your web server. Your switch is a one gigabit per second switch. And then in the middle, you put a 10 100 hub. What do you think is going to happen to the speed of the traffic between your server and the switch, which basically means your server and all the clients that are trying to get to your server? Uh, it is it is going to go to hell. Uh, beyond things such as something called auto negotiation with full duplex and half duplex and a whole bunch of other things that are built into modern switches and modern network cards, putting a hub between your server and the switch in the 2020s, I don't want to say it's a completely asininely stupid idea, but, 
comes pretty close. If you want to do something like this, just just to be clear, when you have a switch, when you have a modern switch, there will be something called a managed switch. We'll talk about this in a minute. With modern managed switches, you can actually clone ports. So that's what a lot of these kids that uh, they're that are saying we should use hubs don't realize is you can actually clone a port within the switch. So you have a one gigabit per second switch. You can clone the port so that all the traffic that goes to your www server also goes to your packet analysis server, basically your analysis server, and that way you have everything actually running at modern networking speeds and you don't add any kind of stupidity into your network. Uh, so hubs and network bridges, do not worry about, they go directly in the trash can. So now let's talk about those switches for a second, right? So talk about the switches, and you'll be used to switches. Switches are everywhere nowadays, right? I literally, I literally just have a switch. I realize I have a switch on my, uh, oh, on the, uh, the thing back there, the shells back there. But you can have a switch. Uh, switches can have uh, just any number of ports, honestly. Uh, so this is a little four-port switch. This is actually made by a company called Buffalo. Uh, they designed it for uh, for surveillance equipment, actually. Uh, so you may have a small switch. Uh, you might use a switch like this uh, in order for a cluster for database servers. You might use a switch like this for a voice over IP telephone system like that if you only need a, a couple of... Um, devices actually connected to your network, you may have a small, a small four port switch. You may, may have an eight port switch, a 16 port switch, a 32 port switch, a 48 port switch, 120 some odd port switch. Basically, as far as switch ports go, you can have an absolute metric ton of them or you can have only a couple. So whenever you're going out there to buy a switch, that's one of those things to realize. Uh, if you're going to go out and buy a switch, one of the things that will always remind you is try to future-proof. Do remember, switches will last forever, and especially if you buy a good modern switch. It's probably going to be about as good as you need for the next decade. And so one of the problems that people can run into when they're buying equipment for their company is they go out and they buy a switch with exactly the number of ports they need today. Today. So they go out and they spend, I don't know, let's say $500 or $1,000 on a pretty good, uh, you know, I don't know, a 48 port switch and they have 46 devices connected to their network. Then, you know, boss hires a couple of new employees. All of a sudden you need to add, you know, 10 more wired connections to your network and you need to now go out and buy an entirely new 48 port switch that can get expensive. If, on the other hand, you would simply over-provision, basically you bought more than you needed when you bought the Switch the, the first time, then you would have more than enough ports and it wouldn't cost you that much more money, right? So if you're looking at buying, let's say, a 16-port switch, you're like, okay, I'm thinking about buying a 16-port switch, and a 16-port switch, let's say for a medium-sized business, is going to cost you 200 bucks, right? A 48-port switch might literally cost you 300 bucks. So if you know your business is going to be growing, just buy the bigger switch. Uh, it, it'll make you happier at the end of the day. Uh, but anyways, uh, when you're dealing with a switch, again, basically what switches are is they are the way that you're able to connect all of your hardwired devices to the network. So your router is going to get connected to the switch. Your server is going to get connected to the switch. If you have wireless access points, are going to get connected to the switch. Uh, all of your uh, your local computers, your printers, if they have uh, hardwired connections, they are all going to be connected to the switch. Again, with a switch, uh, there is something called a Mac table that is built into the switch. The switch knows what MAC addresses are basically connected uh, to the to the ports on the switch. And so when one computer tries to communicate with another computer, there's something called ARP, Address Resolution Protocol. Address Resolution Protocol resolves IP addresses, TCP IP version 4 IP addresses to MAC addresses. So the computer using ARP will know what MAC address that it's trying to communicate with. It'll say, hey, I want to communicate with a particular MAC address. That will then go into the switch, and then the switch will route that out through the, through the appropriate port. And that way, more or less, unless there's a broadcast or something, only communication is going to the specific ports where the communication needs to go, right? So that's that's where we get out of the whole hub hub problem that we ran into before when we were dealing with Ethernet uh, type networking. Uh, now, when you deal with switches, one of the important things to be thinking about is that there are managed switches 
and there are unmanaged switches, right? And so this is something that you need to think about when you're actually buying your switch equipment. And basically what this means is can you do any configurations on the switch? Uh, so you, with a managed switch, you can change the speed of the ports. So let's say you have some kind of crappy old piece of computer equipment that doesn't understand gigabit per second networking, right? Maybe it's only a 10 megabit per second uh, network card on that crappy ass old server. One of the things that you May need to do is you may need to hard code uh, the speed of the port and the switch so that that server is able to communicate with the rest of the network appropriately. Sometimes uh, there's something called auto negotiation. So with auto negotiation, you have the speed. So 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second, a gigabit per second, 10 gigabits per second, and then you have the duplex. Uh, and that's either half duplex or full duplex. Half duplex means only one side can communicate at a time. Full duplex means both systems can communicate with each other at the same time. So uh, half duplex is like a walkie-talkie. You know, do you do you copy over and then you wait? Uh, full duplex is like a telephone where both people can talk at the exact same time. Normally, when you connect your server or networking equipment to a switch, there's something called auto negotiation. What auto negotiation does is basically the switch communicates with the device that just got connected to it, says, hey, what are you? Uh, the device comes back and says, hi, I'm a 100 megabit per second full duplex connection, or I'm a gigabit per second full duplex connection, or I'm a 10 megabits per second half duplex connection. Uh, the switch goes, okay, and then the port, the port automatically uh, can figures itself uh, for, for whatever that device said. Uh, again, though, if you're dealing with old uh, equipment, old networking equipment, old servers, or if you're dealing with weird proprietary stuff, uh, it may not deal with auto negotiation very well. And so the switch may set the wrong parameters for that port. It may set it to you know full duplex at one gigabit per second, and the server that was connected into it can only do 10 megabits per second uh, at half duplex. And then basically the, the speed of the communication between the server and the rest of the network is going to be absolutely dog crap. I've seen that in the real world. Uh, I actually went to a switch troubleshooting class before. I, eight hours, eight hours of learning how to troubleshoot switch problems. And they showed where you could have a 100 megabit per second network and if the auto negotiation failed, there are certain scenarios where you'll be getting 100 kilobits per second of throughput speed through the switch because one thing would be full duplex, the other would be half duplex. It was a complete mess. So anyways, what, what a managed switch allows you to do is you can go in and you can just hard code the configuration. So I need this to be a 10 megabits per second at half duplex, and then you don't have to worry about quirky problems beyond that. Uh, other than that, uh, when you deal with a managed switch, Generally, you can do uh, something called a quality of service. Uh, basically, this is a prioritization for different networking protocols that are on your network. Uh, so we're gonna have a class on this, something called convergence in the future. But nowadays, you can have your telephones and your surveillance cameras and your computers and your printers and everything else all connected to the exact same switch. The thing is, is that voice over IP traffic should have a much higher priority than email traffic, right? It's more important that voice over IP traffic gets through in a timely manner than it does um, email, right? Because you're actually talking back and forth when you're on a voice over IP uh, call. And so within the switch, you can actually prioritize different protocols so that your voice over IP, your SIP traffic will have a much higher priority over your FTP traffic. Uh, that's something that you can do in a managed switch. In a managed, oops, in a managed switch, you can do, uh, you can create something called VLANs. Uh, so what VLANs are, are virtual LANs, right? So what a LAN is, is basically all the computers that are supposed to be able to communicate with each other, right? So normally you have one switch and this is a LAN, and then you have another switch and this is a LAN, and then if you want them to communicate, you put a router in the middle. Well, again, this is a lot of a lot of actual physical equipment to deal with. So one of the things that you might do with a managed switch is you simply have a managed switch with however many ports in it. And essentially what you can do is you can divide that switch into VLAN 1 and VLAN 2. So this LAN, 
all the devices on this LAN are able to see each other and communicate with each other. All the devices on VLAN 1 are able to see each other and communicate with each other. And then literally, you actually have to put a router uh, in the middle in order to get VLAN 1 to be able to communicate with VLAN 2. Uh, so this might be useful is, is, again, if you start creating those clusters like I was talking about before, right? So let's say we have a switch and then we have the, the database cluster here. Uh, let's say we have an Active Directory cluster cluster over here. Let's say we have that, that web server cluster over here. Um, but they're all, they're basically, they're all in the exact same server rack, but you want them to be segregated so that if somebody is able to hack one of the, the infrastructures, that they're not able to get to the other ones. And so that's where you can use a managed switch and then you can have VLAN 1, two and three the only way these devices can communicate to each other is if there is a router in between uh, with the proper configurations to allow them to communicate uh, so again this is one of those things to be thinking about you know i talk about this a lot in these classes where when you're dealing with technology there, there's the actual science there's the technology and then there is the art right okay i know i know i want a database service for the infrastructure that I'm creating. Okay, should I create a cluster? Okay, now, okay, yes, in order to do a service, it's best to have a cluster. Okay, but for security purposes, right, how you build this out, that's what that's what becomes the art. Uh, and so that's one of the things that you can do with managed switches uh, that you can't do with unmanaged switches. So whenever you deal with an unmanaged switch, like this is an unmanaged switch right here, and it's just a dumb, 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 dumb switch. Now, I know what some of you are saying. Well, I don't want a dumb switch. Dumb switches are like hubs. Put them in the trash can, Eli. But here's the thing. A lot of times, dumb switches are nice, um, especially if you're de dealing with modern uh, networking equipment, right? Again, this particular switch was used. It was actually given to me by Buffalo way back when, FCC compliance there, FTC compliance. Um, and it was given to me for, for a digital surveillance system, right? So basically, let's say you want to create a network you want to connect your uh, your IP surveillance cameras and you don't want to mess with a lot of stuff. You don't you do not have old equipment. You do not have uh, you know different types of equipment, network prioritization, anything like that. Basically, you just want to connect all of your surveillance cameras or all of your voice over IP telephones or whatever. You want them to be able to connect and be able to communicate with each other and that's it. Uh, that's where an unmanaged switch can be very useful. Basically, it's dumb, it auto negotiates, it auto does what it's supposed to do. And to be honest with you, if you're buying a, an unmanaged switch in the 2020s, it, it should be it should be pretty good for you. Um, so that's some of the stuff to be thinking about whenever you're dealing with the switches. Basically, switches are how all of your devices are going to be hardwired connected to each other. Uh, whether you want a, an unmanaged switch or a managed switch really depends on what you're going to be doing. The important thing that I would say, one way or the other, is to make sure you over provision. Do not buy a switch which, with exactly the number of ports that you need. Uh, buy buy a switch with, with a few more ports. Uh, the final thing though with a switch is that you should should keep in mind is the trunk connections. I think this one has a trunk connection. Yep, this is a trunk connection here. If you're going to go out and buy a switch, I, I will tell you one of the sales issues you may, you may get in trouble with, right? You might see a switch and you might see that it has a gigabit per second uh, connection. It's capable of gigabit per second traffic, or it's capable of 10 gig gigabit per second traffic, or it's capable of something a lot higher. One of the important things to understand is that does not necessarily mean every single port on your switch is capable of that speed. One of the things that you have to think about when you're dealing with real infrastructure is many times you actually have to connect switches together, right? Uh, so let's say you had old switches in the past. So somebody bought one switch and then you bought another switch and then you not bought another switch. Or if there's a reason, again, for art purposes, you, you, you wanted to have multiple different switches. One of the things is, is for your local area network, you can connect these switches together. So this is all one LAN. So there's no additional routers or anything like that that basically one switch gets connected to the other switch the other switch gets connected to the other switch and now this is all one LAN. the problem that you can run into though right 
is you have all of these different ports, so all this different traffic on the switches, and the computers, you know, computer here is talking to computer here, and they're talking at like one gigabit per second, right? So that makes sense. Here's the thing, what if the computer here wants to talk to computer here, and computer here wants to talk to computer here, and computer here wants to talk to computer here, and computer here wants to talk to computer here, right? Now, all of a sudden, you have a whole bunch of traffic going through a single port on a switch to be able to communicate with the other devices that the computers on the LAN are trying to communicate with. So the problem is now, if you have four computers all trying to communicate with four computers on a different switch, you have the bottleneck of that the speed of that one switch port. So each of these computers, essentially, instead of getting one gigabit per second, uh, maybe maxes out at 250 megabits per second, right? So basically that one gigabit per second connection divided by four might give you 250 megabits per second, but it's probably going to be a lot slower than that. So that's where you run into some problems if you're simply daisy chaining these switches together. And so what you'll normally have with these switches is over on one side, you'll have essentially trunk connections. So this might be a 10, 100 switch with a one gigabit per second trunk connection. And so you can connect the one gigabit per second trunk connection to, to another one gigabit per second trunk connection on a different switch. And then when traffic is going from one switch to the other one, it's going through at that one gigabit per second speed, not at the 10, 100 speed. So in the modern world, right, uh, you might think about this is the normal speeds are one gigabit per second, and then the trunk line might be 10 gigabits per second. Again, why you can run into problems here is if you're not looking at the documentation, you go, oh, look, it's a 10 gigabit per second switch. Yay. It's a 48 port, 10 gigabit per second second switch for only $500. I'm definitely going to buy that. And then you buy it and you find out one port is 10 gigabits per second. 47 ports are one gigabit per second. Again, for your particular situation, uh, that might run you into some problems. The other thing to be thinking about with these, uh, these, these trunk connections is they may actually use an entirely different media uh, than Ethernet, right? So a lot of times, especially with Cisco equipment, these will actually be fiber optic cables that will connect one to the other. And so you, you might run into a problem where you buy two of these switches. You're like, oh, I'm just going to connect them together. And then you don't have the appropriate fiber optic cable. So that's, that's just one of those things to be thinking about. We'll talk a lot more about switches in a future class. Cause again, kind of like with routers, like you can just have, you can just have a crappy unmanaged switch that just does what it does and you'll probably be happy with it. On the other hand, you can create really, really, really complicated, uh, fancy infrastructure uh, with switches. And so we'll talk about some of the, the other features and functionalities in a more in-depth class later. So the next thing to talk about is basically how you can give Wi-Fi to the users on your network, right? So you have your internet connection, you come in through your modem, you come through in through your router, you then have a switch. The way that your users are able to connect to a Wi-Fi network is then to have a Wi-Fi access point essentially connected to your switch, right? Uh, so when you hear about Wi-Fi access points, you'll hear about 80, uh, 802.11b, uh, 802.11n, uh, or uh, gn, uh, you'll hear about ac, and you'll hear about ax. These are different Wi-Fi standards. And so in order to get the, the best quality of service, the best, best speeds, is you have to have an access point that matches uh, the same speed that your client computers have that are trying to connect to that Wi-Fi access point, right? Uh, so if you have a Wi-Fi access point that's 802.11b, which I think gives you something like 1.5 megabits per, per, per second speed, which is, again, from something somewhere around the 2000 era, and then you have users, then all of their computers have 802.11ax that gives you a gigabit per second speed, uh, then you can run into a problem because basically you will have the bottleneck of you can only go as fast as your wireless access point allows you to go. Uh, so that's one thing to think about. We're, we're going to have another class too. With some of this stuff, it's like we will have another class on this later because this does get a little bit complicated. 
Uh, but this is just some of the stuff to be thinking about. So, uh, so B uh, was the first main uh, standard for Wi-Fi that we had back in the early 2000s. Then we got to G, which was a little bit better. Then we got to N, and then we got to AC, which is really good. And now we're to AX, which is which is actually really, really pretty darn, pretty darn good, uh, you know. Uh, one of the issues that you may run into in your environment is that many times, especially if you buy Cisco grade or enterprise grade networking equipment, is that the uh, the wireless access points will run forever. One of the big issues that you're going to run into uh, whenever you go into an environment is if in the past they bought Cisco, one of the most difficult problems you're going to be dealing with is how to convince the CEO to throw away the equipment that's quote unquote already working so that you can get some equipment that will actually do what needs to get done. Uh, again, Cisco equipment is a type of stuff you plug it in and it will just keep going forever. So the reality is, is in, if in your infrastructure, you may go into a, a warehouse facility or something like that, they may have installed a G and networking equipment years and years and years ago. Um, and your users are having a lot of problems because the specifications for 802.11 G were a lot worse than uh, than what we have in the modern world, and so literally, simply by upgrading your uh, your 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 wireless access points, that may solve a lot of the problems uh, that you're dealing with. Uh, so that's that's one of those things to, to be kind of be thinking about there. Uh, beyond that, one of the interesting things with the, with the wireless access points is you do have to think about uh, Wi-Fi propagation. Uh, so we had this issue back in Baltimore. So when I had my store in Baltimore, uh, I was dealing with commercial clients and home clients and all that kind of stuff. And one of the problems we have in, we had in Baltimore is that back in the old days, uh, construction workers really liked brick. They really, really, really like bread. And so we'd have we'd have walls. We'd have walls would be a foot and a half uh, thick of brick, right? And so you put your wireless access point on one side, you put your computer on the other, and the the basically the, the Wi-Fi signal simply could not get uh, to to the user on the other side. So we had to do some weird creative things. Uh, this is one of the things to be thinking about with, with Wi-Fi access points. So we would have like buildings. So let's say we have a building, right? And then in the middle of the building, we'd have one of these really thick, nasty brick walls. One of the things that we would do is we would actually set up two wireless access points and we would set them up in the basement. This sounds kind of weird, right? But the thing is, is wood floors are a lot easier for Wi-Fi signals to go through than brick walls. Like they're just not going to go through brick walls. So we would have, you know, we'd have the internet connection that would come in. You'd have your modem, you'd have your router, you'd have your switch. On that switch, I would connect a, 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 a Wi-Fi access point on one side of the building. Then I would connect a Wi-Fi access point on the other side of the building. And then basically the users were able to actually connect to the Wi-Fi access point that was in the basement, and that's how they were able to connect to the network. And so when you're dealing with Wi-Fi access points, one of the big things to be thinking about is what is the standard of the Wi-Fi access points that are installed? And then thinking about this kind of thing like with wave propagation, and where are the best places to install Wi-Fi access points so you can actually get the signal to go where people need the signal to go. One of the other things to realize about Wi-Fi access points, and also all of this network equipment, but it really becomes important with the Wi-Fi access points, is that Wi-Fi access points are computers, just like any other computer, sort of, uh, like a server, uh, like your smartphone, right? Uh, they have CPUs inside, they have hardware inside, all right, they, they have their own resources. Uh, these are not promoted a lot, RAM and all that. Uh, manufacturers don't talk about it a lot because most people don't care. But just something to think about is if you have a, a wireless access point that's, that's let's say, 10 years years old, all of the hardware in that wireless access point is going to be from 10 years ago. So again, the speed of the RAM, the speed of the processor, this, the speed of the resources inside may be very subpar uh, compared to what you can get today uh, that's relatively low cost. And so one of the things that I tell people, especially when they're dealing with like Wi-Fi equipment, is really to put your Wi-Fi equipment on a refresh cycle, just like you have your computers, just like you have your desktop desktop computers where or servers uh, you know every every five to maybe eight years basically your your wireless equipment should probably get tossed out 
put new wireless equipment in there and you'll actually see a lot better performance. So that's something to be thinking about like with Wi-Fi access points and all that kind of stuff, the wave propagation, the different types. Again, we'll have a much longer class on it, but this is how your Wi-Fi users are able to connect to your hard wired network is through these access points. Now, one of the types of, of Ethernet networking equipment that I don't think gets talked about enough is power line networking equipment. This has been an absolute lifesaver in the real world for me, and I think is a really cool type of networking equipment that, again, for some reason just gets overlooked a lot. So let's say you have your building, right? So let's say you have your building, and for some reason you're not able to run wire in your building. Uh, possibly you have exposed brick, right? So you're in like a, a, some kind of you know architectural ar architectural a texture digest uh, type building where everything is beautiful and pretty and the brick is exposed so you cannot run networking equipment on the brick uh, or again it might be a historic building you can't you can't run networking equipment for some reason like that uh, this may be a property that's being rented uh, by your client and so you're not able to cut holes and walls or that type of thing but basically in this environment you may need to actually uh, run a hardwired network network connections without actually being able to run networking cable. And so what Powerline allows you to do is it actually allows you uh, to use your electrical wiring in your building to run the network signal. So you put an adapter, so let's say you have your little server room in the basement. There is a power outlet in that server room. You connect a power line adapter in the server room. Then up in the top floor, maybe that's where you have all your computers, right? You can actually put another power line adapter up there, connect a network cable, connect a switch, and then connect all of your computers to that switch that connects to the power line equipment that then uses the electrical wiring that's already in the building to get the communication down to your servers. So power line equipment can be absolutely awesome. And the great thing too is again, like I say, on either side, you can put switches. So if you're gonna try to do things like surveillance cameras, so let's say you have uh, IP surveillance cameras and you need to put the IP surveillance cameras in places where no network cabling is run, uh, you might actually want to use power line networking uh, in order to create a network connection for that camera. Now, to be clear, this is not power over Ethernet. We'll talk about power over Ethernet in a minute. This is simply the network connection that then gets you down to the network video recorder or down to the uh, the data center or the server room that you have in your premises. Uh, th again, this might be good if you have a voice over IP telephone system and for some reason you cannot run a hardwired connection to to wherever you want the voice over IP telephone, you can use power line networking. Uh, power line networking is one of those things, um, it was really good, like, 15 years ago, I think 15 years ago, probably got pretty stable. At this point in time, it's pretty darn rock solid. So if you're having an issue with not being able to run network cable, for some reason not not being able to or not wanting to use Wi-Fi, power line equipment can be absolutely awesome. So the final thing that I want to talk about today is PoE. It's called Power Over Ethernet, and it's really cool. It is really, really, really cool, right? So back in the old days, back in the old days, whenever we were going to connect a device to the network, right, whether it was a telephone, uh, whether it was a camera, or whether it was a, a computer of some sort, uh, it actually needed multiple connections, right? It needed a connection to the network, but then it actually also needed a connection, a power connection to actually be able to power the device. You run into a lot of problems with this though because it, many times where you can run a network cable, you don't necessarily have a power outlet right there on the wall, especially like if you're gonna do something like a surveillance camera. If you wanna put a surveillance camera, you know, 30 feet up in a warehouse, you're not necessarily going to have a power plug right beside it. Uh, and the important thing to understand is whenever you get an electrician uh, to run an electrical wire for you and put a power outlet, it is going to cost you a lot of money. 
you thought $150, you know, to, to get one run of cable in a building was a lot of money. Oh my golly, when you start doing actual real electrical work, $150 seems absolutely cheap. So they came up with this concept called Power Over Ethernet. And so what Power Over Ethernet does is you can have your device not simply get your network connection uh, from your switch, but your switch can actually also provide power to the device. I think at this point in time, they're up to 60 watts. You can actually deliver up to 60 watts of power to the devices. There's 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 lesser there's lesser wattages too. But basically, you can just simply you can plug in your voice over IP phone. You can plug in your surveillance camera. Some computers, if they're actually configured to allow this to happen, you can actually plug in your computer uh, to to a power over ethernet switch and that will give the network connection and it will give the power all, all from one place. Uh, essentially what happens when you're using PoE is there's multiple different powers that your PoE switch can offer. 60 watts, 30 watts, multiple different wattages. What happens is your switch communicates with your PoE device, says hey, what standard do you use? Your PoE device then says how much wattage it needs, and then the PoE switch is able to ride that amount of wattage, and away you go. Relatively simple. The one big thing to think about with this, if you're gonna be using PoE in your infrastructure, is uh, PoE switches have been getting more and more and more powerful over the years. So before, they, they could power very little. Now they can pull powerful laptops and that type of thing. One of the issues that you might run into is you may have a device that actually requires more power than your power over ethernet switch can provide. And then if that's the case, essentially you just need to swap out that power over ethernet switch plug in a new power over ethernet switch and away you go. Um, it is important to understand with power over ethernet switches, uh, they do not, all the ports do not need to be connected uh, to devices that need power. So you could have a server plugged into a PoE switch, you could have your printer plugged into a PoE switch, you can have a lot of different things that are just plugged into a normal electrical outlet, but then the devices that need power, uh, they, they will actually request power from the power over ethernet switch so that the switch can then power those particular devices. So power over ethernet is really great. Again, if you're dealing with VoIP, if you're dealing with surveillance cameras, if you're dealing with anything like that, it can be very, very useful and it can be good. Like something to be thinking about like with laptops and all that, if you're gonna be buying equipment in the future, is running low power networking cable is a lot less expensive than running full-fledged electrical connections. And so one of the things you might think about for your facility, especially like... Um, like with the open office plans, right? You know, that's the cool thing nowadays. It's horrible, horrible. Can I say open office plans are horrible? But anyways, anyways, they're still making them. So one of the things is, right, you have an open office plan, you know people's laptops or devices are gonna need to get powered. If you have to run uh, real electrical wires to every single place, that'll get very expensive. Plus running real electrical wire, there's a lot more regulations, a lot more stuff that goes along with it. So one of the things you may think about is, hey, if we can just run network cables instead, it's going to cost us a lot less money. It's not, we're not gonna need the same permits and all that type of thing. And that might be a much better way to go in your particular environment. So there you go. That is the basics of the hardware that makes up your Ethernet, most likely TCP IP version 4 network. Now that you understand these different components, it'll get a little bit easier to talk about how you build out uh, whatever kind of network it is that you want. One of the big things to understand with this type of networking equipment is essentially it's all kind of sort of the same it just gets bigger and more expensive in the in the the, the larger environment you're in right so uh, so a switch like this you know from Buffalo is probably gonna cost you about thirty dollars and it's essentially a four port switch this more or less works a lot like you know, a, a $50,000 switch from Cisco that you might put into an office environment that has a thousand ports on it or something like that, or 10,000 ports, right? One of the interesting things with networking is 
the same concept scales up very well. So whether you're dealing with a, a $30 router that you got from Best Buy, or you're dealing with a $10,000 router, router that you got from Cisco, a lot of it comes down to essentially what load it's going to be other and under and some of the requirements. But the basic concept of what the router does whether it's $20 or $20,000 is basically the same. So again, like when I was talking about the modem, right? Whether you're dealing with the DSL modem, whether you're dealing with 5G modem, whether you're dealing with CSU, DSU, something called ad trans back in the day, right? And they're, they're all gonna be like same, same, but different, right? If you have a T1 connection, it's gonna look, a modem is gonna look a lot the same, gonna inter be worked on about the same as a T3 connection or something like that. Uh, so that, that's one of the, the useful things that's interesting here. Again, the modem is what is going to turn your IPv4 Ethernet network communication into something that the ISP can actually use so that the ISP can then forward that traffic on to the fiber optic connections that it's connected to that are essentially the backbone of the internet. Again, the router, routers separate uh, the IP networks that you've created, right? So you create your IP address scheme, you know, your, your IP address, your subnet mask, your default gateway, all that kind of thing. The router is what separates the network. The router says, okay, what is inside is your LAN, what is outside is the WAN or the internet. If you can't find it on the LAN, it'll get routed out to the WAN or the internet. And that's basically what the router does. What becomes interesting though, again, when you start thinking about building out your infrastructure, is you can get multiple IP addresses from your ISP. And so you could have multiple companies uh, running in your, your infrastructure, right? And so again, this might be something to think about if you're a managed service provider, want to create a managed service provider business, and you want to create cloud services specifically for each individual client you have. So this rack is for client one. This rack is for client two. This rack is for client three. You could literally have an external IP address, you know, 202.66.54.4. This could be dot five. This could be dot six. All the traffic for this client comes in this rack. All the traffic for this client comes in this rack. All the traffic for this client comes in this rack. And that would be a lot more secure than simply having all of their servers on the exact same network and then trying to uh, protect them using permissions or privileges, that type of thing, right? And that's one of the things to consider uh, that can be very interesting. Again, switches, you've got the unmanaged switches and the managed switches. Remember, basically the, the unmanaged switches are dumb switches. They auto negotiate, they do what they do. Uh, managed switches allow you to go in there and do a lot of configurations. One of the questions you have to ask yourself is do you really want to do any configurations? You probably don't. <laughs> So you might want to save a lot of money by getting an unmanaged switch. Uh, the important thing to be thinking about there is that you make sure you provision more ports than you actually need. If you're already using 12 ports, you know, I would say just buy a 48 port switch. You'll probably be happier at the end of the day. Just kind of one of those uh, things to consider. Uh, we talked about hubs and bridges. Just don't, just don't, just don't, do not care. We talked about wireless access points. That basically gives you your Wi-Fi access. We talked about power line networking. And initially we talked about the uh, network cable and we talked about the network interface cards. Again, I think one of the big problems we're gonna start seeing in the 2020s is really, really, really old network cable that's starting to bite more and more companies in the butt, right? Back in the 90s, somebody spent a lot of money to run network cable in a building, and then it's, it's the 2020s and people can't figure out why their systems are so slow. I'll put $5 on the table. It's because you got Cat3 uh, network cabling that was only specced out for 10 megabits per second. I can see a lot of tech people are gonna have some very, very, very stupid arguments. <laughs> because again, C CEOs have zero interest in buying essentially what they feel like they already bought before. What we spent, I remember when we wrote the check for that. We already have network cabling. Oh, that, that's its own argument. So anyways, again, we're going to have some uh, some more classes going, going a little bit more deep dive into to all of these different different products, different technologies that you'll use. I just kind of want to give you an overview here just to so get a better idea of what the networking equipment looks like when it actually gets installed into an infrastructure. Um, as always, I enjoy doing this particular class and look forward to seeing the next one.